Welcome back, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you on the 13th of August, 2015. And I'm sure I don't need to tell my regular viewers that some big things are afoot in Turkey right now and in Syria, where things are heating up once again. So we have a very special guest lined up for you today to talk about that. We're talking to Sibel Edmonds, who I'm sure the regular followers of BoilingFrogsPost.com and the Probable Cause podcast will know has been out of the country, uh, in the region actually, for, well, a, too long now, altogether too long. So back from the region with some intel and to update us on what's happening there is Sibel Edmonds, BoilingFrogsPost.com. Sibel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, James. I'm jet lagged, so I'm trying not to slur too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I won't. Uh, I'll try not to tax you too much, but I do want to get out some of this information that uh, that you have stored up here. So let's talk about this region. Obviously, again, as people know, things are heating up once again in Syria, partially due to an agreement that was reached between Washington and Ankara on July 27th for creation of some. ISIL free zones, which uh, Turkey may be interpreting as uh, Kurdish free zones, basically. But uh, but let's let's set the scene of that agreement by talking about an incident that took place a week before it was reached in uh, the southeastern Turkish town of Surik, where the uh, social the Federation of Socialist Youth were preparing uh, basically an expedition to Kobani uh, across the border in Syria to help the reconstruction of that uh, that devastated uh, area. And lo and behold, a terrorist bombing strikes, uh, leaving 31 dead and close to 100 injured. Uh, a very dramatic incident that, of course, ramps up the tension and basically allows for Turkey to say, hey, wait, we're under attack, we have to ramp something up. And then, lo and behold, they reach an agreement with Washington to do so. A very interesting bombing in terms of its timing, but uh, I understand you were in the region when this happened. What's, uh, what's your take on what actually happened there in Zurich? Well... About two weeks before the incident, I was talking with a person there who was with a special military unit in Turkey, and a very highly specialized unit. And I was told uh, that the order directive has been given for um, full extensive war preparation going from where they have been to that degree and for operation that was going to start at the end of April and be finished within six months, which would bring us to about November with expectations of triggering events taking place in the month of July. And so in the months of May and June, actually Turkish special forces and other units, including medical units, have been setting setting up special barracks to handle any injured, et cetera, et cetera, along the border. So that conversation I had actually two weeks before the event, and I was within 150 kilometers of, of where the event took place. And again, this was expected to say that in July, triggering events were going to take place. So that's for that portion of it. But other uh, kind of strange events took place from people I spoke with. Uh, certain eyewitnesses uh, were rounded up before they were able to give their statement to the media that showed up there within uh, within an hour or so. And that was highly mysterious. There were many, many speculations around that, why they rounded up these uh, eyewitnesses. I guess some of those people were um, told what to tell the media. Again, that's a speculation. Others maybe didn't even speak with the media. But uh, there has been deferring um eyewitness uh, accounts of, of how it took place. And not only that, a few days before the uh, event, um, by uh, just an indirect or unintentional leak, a uh, certain newspaper reporter was told that some female suicide uh, bombers are going to attack targets within Turkey and it's going to happen you know, within this month. So whether it was an intentional leak or not, I don't know. But the fact that the Turkish intelligence agencies and the police, they had supposedly this, uh, these tips. So it was not unexpected. It didn't come as a shock. The casualties, of course, were a major, major shock, especially 
considering the people who were targeted there, it was in a way it seemed to be killing you know two birds with one stone uh, for for the group that had their meeting there, and this is an NGO volunteer group who tried to set up parks, etc., for underprivileged. Um, uh, po- segments of the population in that region. So there are, again, lots of uh, highly questionable uh, situations there with with some speculations. But I would say for me personally, it went beyond the speculations. As I said, two weeks before that, I was told that this was a timeline and this was going to happen and hinged upon certain agreements between Turkey and the United States. And we'll get into the obstacles that are on the way because it's not written in the stone, the agreement between U.S. and Turkey on Syria. Very interesting. And uh, let's keep in mind this also took place in a highly sensitive region in Senate, in that Surik Senolifra corridor where Turkish intelligence and security are all over the place. So um, again, highly suspicious. But it does set the stage for this agreement, however strong or weak that agreement may be. Let's talk a little bit about the implications of what's been happening there for the last couple of weeks and where we see this going forward from here. Obviously, as uh, we reported here on Corbett Report recently, this agreement essentially is uh, uh, being used by Turkey as a green card to start, you know, basically bombing the uh, the, the Kurdish uh, and get, trying to get rid of the Kurdish uh, from the area as well and creating these Kurdish free zones as well as the ISIL free zones that apparently Washington was supposedly going for here. But I think everyone knows that this is all um, something of an excuse uh, for everyone, every vested interest in Syria to to use this towards their own agenda. Let's get your own take on what is developing from this agreement and where it's going from here. Well, again, you, uh, you basically touched upon the highlights of what the vested interests would accomplish from these attacks. But the agreement, as far as the agreement goes, it is in a very, very volatile situation uh, because of one keyword and one major, major factor, and that's the Kurdish factor. Because I don't know if you have been following in details, but the United States have been coming on and off saying that they have better chance to join forces with the Kurdish factions in the area. Area And that's not only for Syrian Kurdish faction, but also uh, along the Turkish borders and also in northern Iraq, because you are looking at the largest ethnic group without land in the world today. You're looking at tens and tens of millions of Kurdish people. And the fact that this is what U.S. has been saying, they are better trained. They know the area better. They are more... um, They are more uh, savvy in terms of fighting guerrilla warfare, especially in special terrains in the mountainous regions of that northern Iraq and, of course, northern Syria, etc. Well, that has been a major no-no with Turkey. In fact, for this agreement to take place now, just recently, versus, let's say, six months or two years ago, that has always been a major uh, disagreement between Turkey and the United States. So Turkey has been saying, we will do it and we'll basically do your dirty laundry and you can have not only your own base, this is the United uh, United States base in Injerlik in Adana, but also we provide you the use, free use of our other, other bases we have. And as you know, with the recent attack bombing, there were U.S. forces in a special uh, Turkish base using the drones that were remotely controlled in uh, Nevada. And, and that's, that's exactly what was used. So there were some really good, interesting pictures there on Turkish, in Turkish newspapers. So uh, that has been a huge issue between, the, between Turkey and the United States. And the United States also has been telling Turkey that um, we are also hesitant doing certain things with your agreeing on certain um, items that you're requesting because the moment we give you some of these, uh, let's say, the green light together with the, with the needed um, you know, weaponry, etc., you are going to turn around and use it on Kurds. And um, 
I really need to pause here because I know many of the people listening and watching, they have no idea who Kurdish people are. And, um, uh, and it's unfortunate, really, because of the coverage, I guess, in mainstream media, but also the small, small-mindedness of people saying, why do I need to know about Kurds or why do I need to know about these details, seeing these as insignificant details. So this is not for those people. Uh, what I want to talk about is the Kurdish factor is not only important for the United States in this case of Syria. Kurds in northern Iraq have been used. Again, this has not been reported by U.S. media. Since we went to Iraq in 2003-2004, Israel has established several bases in northern Iraq. Okay, So there has been this agreement between Israelis and the northern certain factions in northern Iraq Okay, to let U.S. install these bases and they jointly operate Many Israeli people are based there. It's just an informal, unannounced military base, intelligence base combination combination for Israel to spy on Iran. Okay, so that's number one. But it goes beyond spying on Iran. They are also trying to forge certain relationship and partnership with the Kurds in Iran. And again, this is not for the ignorance out there, but Iran also has a large population of Kurds there. And that would be in northwestern Iran. So you're looking at vested interest, and that was a very important key uh, word that you used there. So Israelis have vested interest on this Kurdish Kurdish issue, okay, that, that the U.S. is right now having this struggle with Turkey. Turks have it. Syrians have it. Iraqi government has it. United States have it. So right now, the biggest factor issue, the, the, the determinant factor out there is the Kurdish factor. And I really don't see how it can be in any way put aside because it's some kind of a factor that cannot be set aside. And we see it with with the recent bombing in Istanbul, the police station, and because they are saying, and again, I don't know who to believe, the newspapers, including U.S. newspapers, saying PKK claimed responsibility for that. Did they? Was it really PKK? We don't know. But I would say we need to watch the situation with the Kurds. And this agreement, especially with the latest statements from the United States, that they are seeing this strategy <clears throat> of using and working with the Kurdish factions against ISIS, which is not against ISIS, it's against uh, Basa, uh, uh, Assad's government. Uh, it's, uh, it, it makes the agreement kind of much more uh, on a shakier grounds than it was even, I would say, a week ago. Well, that's right. I mean, again, I think we have to understand that this agreement in these safe zones, not really fundamentally about ISIS at all, fundamentally about the Kurds, and of course, also the foot in the door for the uh, overthrow of Assad, which is still has always been and continues to be the main priority uh, for the US at any rate. Um, what are the other, what's the position of the other uh, co coalition members on this, uh, the Jordanians, the Saudis, the Qataris, the others that have helped ISIS? Do they have a position on the Kurdish issue in, in particular? Because they don't have Kurdish problem or the factor within their countries, I would say that factor is not important. But I'm glad you brought it up because a new uh, rumors began floating about two weeks ago in the region. And that would be I was in Turkish region, northern Iraq region. So the rumor was that, in fact, many of these female suicide bombers, and supposedly many of them are still around and lurking around in Istanbul. They are targeting at least three, four targets in Istanbul. They, they could say that with certainty there were five of them highly dangerous with, with, uh, with mission that they were going to use as a suicide bombing. But the latest rumors keep becoming that, in fact, these women were not from Syria. They were not Kurdish but that all these women are from Tunisia. And that was the first time I'm hearing all the stuff on Tunisia. So I started now in my little things that I have with my favorite sites, putting the keyword Tunisia to see what is about to happen there because where would that come from? Suddenly saying that these 
female suicide bombers are neither Kurdish or ISIS from, from uh, Syria, but they are Tunisian women. Why would Tunisian women suicide bombers end up in Turkey with targets? That just, again, begs the question. So I'm glad you brought up uh, that point. And Jordan always has been, Jordan is already a done deal with the U.S., the agreement. As you and I reported before Syria became headline news in the United States in 2011, you and I covered the informant that uh, the that gave us the tip on the uh, northern Iraq and also in in Jordan, the base in Jordan, but also my sources who told me that in 2011 May, United States in Turkey in Injilik base in Adana, so southern part of Turkey, they began bringing in training, arming these factions. Factions, the same ones that right now they're being called ISIS, you know, against Assad, and they were then funneling them back into Syria. So this is four years old. This is since 2011 May. And uh, of course, six, seven months after we reported, Syria began slowly creeping into the headline news here in the United States. So to say that uh, ISIS and, and what is ISIS? I mean, really? Um, it's, it's a self-created uh, brand name. In fact, another thing I would like to mention, again, from people who have been on both sides of the borders between Syria and Turkey, and they are reporting blue-eyed, heavy, thick British accent people, not in dozens, but in hundreds. And they are dressed as what we see depicted as ISIS. And the people I spoke with, they, are, they have no reason to come up with any conspiracy. These are the people actually who work for um, Turkish military in, in uh, various uh, positions and with different kinds of relationship, but they are in and out and they are saying everybody knows. It's not like I'm leaking and giving you some inside information, but the region is swarming with heavily uh, British accented uh, Brits there. No, this this flat. isn't. Uh, yeah, this isn't conspiracy theory. It's now no, admitted. No. Sunday Express has been reporting the SAS are dressing up as ISIS fighters. This Absolutely. is now mainstream news. Absolutely, and many, many, many sources have reported this. And these are that includes truck drivers who are still going in and out between the between the two regions. So that's for me. That's a fact. It's not some kind of a speculation or some kind of a rumor. No, it certainly isn't. And of course, we're just seeing the exact same types of things that we saw in the run up to the uh, the war in Libya. So uh, again, British special forces on the ground uh, causing mayhem. Um, well, all right. So we are definitely seeing some sort of movement in Syria right now. And it looks like it's following the sort of general trend that we usually see of a ramp up in the summer and some some psychological preparation events. And then when everyone returns in the fall in September, October, likely some sort of actual action happening, just as we saw an, an attempt to get a Syrian invasion o underway. Uh, what was that? Was that two years ago now? With the hands off Syrian. Hinging upon that. Kurdish factor. Exactly. But do we have, so does that fit in with the timeline that we're looking at here? Do we have any indication of what kind of timeline we're looking at if this is to go into some sort of more advanced stage of operation in Syria? I think the initial, based on what I was told, the, the initial plan, and this was U.S.-Turkey plan, it was not Turkish plan, was it would end within six months after April, so it will end in November. But as, as, as I said, the question marks become a Kurdish question. And in the past, I would have said, well, we also need to watch and see what's going to happen with Russia and what kind of message, what kind of stand we are going to witness and see from the Russian side. And frankly, James, looking at uh, RT news, uh, nauseating, <laughs> I haven't been um, accepting any interview requests. And they basically lost what made them special. And uh, they said, okay, now let's become more mainstream. Like, well, they are, they are now dime of a dozen, you know, it's a dime a dozen. And, and they are, there is no, nothing to differentiate them from Al Jazeera or from any CNN or et cetera. But from what I see, from what I read, it seems like Russia has already given the green light because they are parroting exactly the same lines with ISIS. 
that we see in mainstream media in the United States, and that includes paper in Russia. And uh, a lot of Russian tourists, they're, they're, they have lots of money. <laughs> they're traveling in uh, Turkey, Eastern Europe, in lavish resorts. I spoke with many of them because we ended up bumping to each other everywhere I went. They were there, Russians. I was talking with them. And it seems to be the the very similar position as as uh, the majority here in the United States they 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 consider them the threat even to Russian interests the ISIS a problem that needs to be taken care of and 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 it shouldn't be dragged so with the Russian obstacle out of the way and with the Kurdish question floating in there if that is overcome in the past, the United States and long time before that with Brits, they have always sacrificed the Kurds. <laughs> so it's for them always has been, you know what, we use them and then we turn around and we just feed them to the wolves. And that has happened. And I have no idea why many Kurds haven't learned the lesson that they form alliance, whether it's with Israel, whether it's with U.S., whether it's with the Britain. And they do things. They end up serving their interests. And in the end, they always have been fed back to the to their abusers, <laughs> whether it's been, let's say, in the Iran in 1960s and 1950s or, let's say, with Turkey. And that, that's the part that I have a hard time understanding. And, uh, and I'm sure there will be people who would disagree with me and say, well, it is not as you view it. Here are the things. But I have spoken with certain Kurds. And, and I have been told, including a particular group with presence in England, and I met with them in London, and they said, um, Israelis understand our dilemma because they had the same kind of situation and they had to do what they had to do to get where they are today. And to me, that really frightens me. And, and again, there are many factions, there are many different groups, warriors. There are great freedom fighters, Kurdish. I, I, I'm, I'm not putting every Kurd in one bucket. But when I talk to these people and now they see uh, Israel as their guardian angel in northern Iraq, or in this case, the United States in northern Syria, I have to shake my head and say, remember what happens every time. You are used royally, and in the end, when they are finished, they don't want you to have your land. They don't want you to have your nation. But I guess maybe it's this wishful thinking that this time around it will be different, that we will be given, you know, there will be a portion carved out from northern Iraq and from southern Turkey and northern Syria, and we will have our nation. There's no way Turkey is going to allow that. That's not going to happen. There's no way Iran is going to allow that. That, I guess, leaves Syria. But even with Syria taking place, let's say we take over Syria, we get rid of Assad, and we carve out a portion, Turkey would not accept a Kurdish nation in its southern border. It will never happen. But, but I don't know why. The... I mean, it's a ridiculous discrimination. It's this whole set of things. I, I, I find it illogical, but it will, they won't let it happen. But but wouldn't I, I, so I, I, I certainly understand and, and uh, what's going on here. But ultimately, doesn't the Kurdish population work better as a chess piece for the U.S. and Israel as as that destabilizing influence? Do they actually want to create a Kurdistan, or is it just better to have them as that pocket of resistance that they can use in various countries like Iran, in Turkey, in Syria? Exactly. I mean, that that's that was the point I was trying to make. And you articulated far better. Oh, sorry. Than me because <laughs> yeah, okay. That's what they use them. But let's say after the operation is finished. OK. And let's say Cur Turks come and they do a post operation after Syria operation. And they let's say massacre 15,000 Kurds. U.S. would not blink. They won't interfere. They won't do anything. They let the same situation continue. So they're going to find themselves back where they were where they are today. It, the situation, the position has not changed. Okay. I, I see that you raised pr probably one of the most important things when it comes to taking a look at the impossibility of increased um, military action in Syria, which is, of course, the Russian question, which has always been there on the table. And as you say, Russia is now seeming to make uh, some olive branches on this uh, fighting the Islamic State, so we have to fight idea. And um, we can have more on that from Russian for uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, who's apparently making the media rounds now talking about a Putin initiative to un unite and 
create a united front against ISIS. So I think we see where that's tending. And uh, f I don't know, it, everything seems to me to be shaping up towards uh, some sort of actual military um, uh, ramping up in September, October. We'll have to see what events take place between now and then. But I think something else that we should cover um, while we're on the subject of media and uh, media actually doing its job we saw a surprising example of that from Al Jazeera, of all places, with Mehdi Hassan on Hardline, interviewing former DIA director, um, was it Michael Flynn? And, uh, and uh, about those tw uh, documents that were recently released via FOIA, we talked about here in the Corbett Report, I know you've discussed it on Boiling Frog's post, that revealed that the DIA back in 2012 wrote, if the situation unravels in Syria, there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria. And this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want in order to isolate the Syrian regime. That was penned in 2012 by the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency of the Pentagon. And uh, so Mehdi Hassan puts it to uh, the former DIA chief, well, what, what happened then? How, if you foresaw this, how did it happen? And the former DIA chief says, I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision on the part of Washington to basically allow the rise of this Salafist principality, a.k.a. the Islamic State. Some pretty interesting uh, admissions there from someone who I guess was thrown under the bus and is now spilling the beans about what really happened. Of course, absolutely none of this is surprising to uh, to yourself, myself, or any of the listeners in our particular audiences, I'm sure, but still interesting that this is coming out and that it 110% confirms exactly what we said about this nonsense about blowback that we always knew was going to be a cover for uh, for what's happening there. And, uh, and just once again, history repeating itself where it turns out, lo and behold, surprise, surprise, wouldn't you know it, we created the enemies that we're now fighting. Um, any any thoughts on this uh, latest revelation by Michael Flynn? Right. This is a perfect example of, of the controlled opposition. You're looking at a controlled leak and a stage revelation. There is no revelation. This is completely within the script of what actually the government has been giving. And, and what it takes us, it takes us back to 1980s when the same line were used. This guy is equivalent of Michael Schur, okay? He is the equivalent identical twin in terms of the Hollywood CIA script of Michael Schur, of the blowback, okay? Coming, supposedly spilling the beans. What beans? Saying that... Yeah, we turned a blind eye and we let them mushroom there and morph into the Salafis. When again, you and I reported in 2011, in 2011, that was not the case. We created them. We brought them, created them, trained them, armed them, funneled them back. They are us, like toys are us. ISIS are us. Actually, good. They're kind of a rhyme there. ISIS are us. And, and uh, so here it is, again, using the same line, what we did with the, with the Michael Shures and all the blowback actors there talking about, oh, yeah, we, you know, we supported Mujahideen and then we looked the other way when it morphed, when it morphed into Al-Qaeda with bin Laden. Really? Is that really the case? But again, look where it's being reported. As I said, Al Jazeera, RT, I don't see any difference. But um, And this guy, <laughs> he's not. He, he, he is uh, spilling their beans, the beans that they created to be spilled. And you know it, I know it. And I believe many of the people who watch your show, they know it. Unfortunately, the majority will buy that too. And again, we look the other way. Maybe the lesson here is, as you see some indication, you go and you bomb them. You actually bomb them and declare war before anything happens, okay? Maybe while they are fetus in their mama's uh, belly, that's when you go bomb them, you know? <laughs> that's, maybe that's the, that's the lesson the majority will draw from this. We have to yes. bomb them while they are fetuses. Exactly. So before we have anything, indication of who these people are, we should be killing them. Um, yes, I think you're right. That probably will be the ultimate line that people take away from this if they take anything at all. But if you blink, you probably would have missed this whole story. And uh, if you're not paying attention, you probably wouldn't care anyway. So you'd probably be more obsessed with Donald Trump and Cecil Lyon. Um, 
Well, such is life in in uh, the Western developed democracies in 2015. Well, things I'm sure are about to get a lot more interesting, and I'm sure you have a lot more to say, and people can thankfully look forward to the return of the Probable Cause podcast. I'm sure everyone, like myself, is waiting for bated breath for you to, uh, to come back with your, your latest report and more intel. Is there anything else you'd like to drop here before we uh, wrap things up today? No, I think we covered it pretty well, and, and with Probable Cause, I guess I will do some segments the day I was leaving the United States for our long, long trip, uh, the news broke. Actually, I got all these messages on my phone about Dennis Hastert. And again, how that story was turned and suffocated and turned into something totally different than what actually it was. And how and why it was completely by the mainstream media not mention the fact that Dennis Hastert was exposed. I did it 2005, 2006, 2007. I wrote a whole fiction book. He shows up there. <laughs> so that, that I, will, I will cover that in one of my probable cause coming one. And also a lot of Turkish internal politics of what's going to happen, as you know, with the elections, the Erdogan administration was unable to uh, have the majority. They have failed the, all the various political factions to form a coalition government. So it's heading towards an early election this October. They are looking into end of October. And the domino effects of certain things that may take place between now, actually it has been taking place to a certain degree until then, and how that can change the outcome or influence the outcome. These are all sorts of interesting things that have been taking place. And hopefully I will be able to cover it in and maybe maybe smaller, more digestible chunks within probable cause. And I appreciate you inviting me for this show. And uh, it's always a, a privilege to be with you, James. It's always an honor to have you on. You're welcome, of course, absolutely anytime. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about the Tur Turkish internal politics and how that will factor into all of this. And the Hastert story, I completely forgot about that story until you just mentioned it. But yes, as soon as I saw it, I thought, where is Sabelle? Why is she leaving now? We need her on this case. Was so it I'm time? Very much Here's a conspiracy forward. theory. Was it time as I was boarding my plane <laughs> that it shows up? <laughs> It's, it's the perfect timing for people who want to sweep it under the rug anyway. Well, I'm glad you're not going to let that happen. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing your follow up on that story, because I think it is an important one that we shouldn't forget. So once again, people can follow, of course, the Probable Cause podcast, along with all the other podcasts at BoilingFrogsPost.com. Please do so. Sabelle Edmonds, great to have you back. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.